recording. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, you are here for the Nebraska Saline Wetlands in the Salt Creek Tiger Beetle webinar, which is part of uh, this month's the American Wetlands Month um, webinar series that we are putting on Fish and Wildlife Education Division at Nebraska Game and Parks is putting on virtually for everyone. So we've had some really great discussions so far. We've had some really great webinars and I believe we have one more next Tuesday all about wetland wildlife. Um, so we'll certainly share the link and the registration for that in the chat afterwards. And I believe you'll also get a, an email and a, a follow up and evaluation for this and there'll be some links in there for more talks and more resources on um, what our division at Nebraska and Parks provides. We, we do a lot of these really great resources um, and, and other things like that and probably more resources maybe if if our guest speakers tonight um, have some awesome resources that they that they mentioned tonight we'll make sure to also share those with you because um, we're all about sharing those educational resources so thank you for coming tonight um, we're going to hear from two really exciting scientists we were just talking about science literacy and how important that is and look at this we get to hear from two scientists tonight so that's exciting um, so the first uh, scientist we get to hear from is Ted LaGrange. He's the wetland program manager at Nebraska Game and Parks. And um, he's going to be speaking to us about the saline wetlands in Nebraska, a really unique ecosystem found right here in Nebraska. I'm really excited to hear more about that. And then after that, we're going to be um, hearing from Sean Dunn, who's a zoologist. I feel like I still want to be a zoologist when I grow up. I haven't decided between a zoologist or an entomologist or a herpetologist, so I'll, I'll still decide. Sean, maybe. Or, wet, or a wetland biologist. Or a huh? wetland biologist. Yeah, maybe I'll make some decisions tonight, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, I didn't say who I was, I'm sorry. Um, anyways, so we'll hear from Sean Dunn um, after, after Ted, and he's gonna be speaking to us about the Salt Creek Tiger Beetle, a very unique, amazing insect that's, that's really only found in those saline wetlands. Very, very exciting stuff tonight. My name is Amber Schiltz. I'm the Wildlife Education Program Manager of the Fish and Wildlife Education Division, and I'll be um, the host tonight. Um, so I will be monitoring questions. If you have any questions during any of the speakers' uh, presentations, please uh, put it in the chat. I'll make sure to monitor it. Um, if they get to a good stopping point, we'll make sure to uh, pause for those questions because we definitely want to get those answered if we can. Um, we are recording this, and it will be available afterwards on our, we have a Nebraska Game and Parks Education YouTube channel. And so all that will be sent to you also in a link if you'd like to watch it again or share it as a resource. Um, I don't think I'm, did I forget anything? I don't think so. Introduced everybody? Yep. Hey. All right. So Ted, would you like to get us started? You can yeah. tell us a little bit more about what you do if you'd like and, yeah. then, and then get started on um, your exciting presentation. Screen to share here. You see that okay? Yeah. Yes, that looks good. So, yeah, well, thank you, Amber. And uh, yeah, pleased to do this with Sean and welcome everyone. So, yeah, I work uh, statewide uh, with our in our wildlife division on wetlands. Uh, so, kind of anything related to wetland conservation, I uh, tend to, to be involved with uh, one way or another. Um, and have been out here about uh, 28 years working uh, across the state. But what today I'm going to be talking about are some wetlands in, our, in my backyard here of Lincoln, uh, the very unique uh, saline wetlands of Nebraska. And so what I'm going to cover in my part before we hand it off to Sean is the geographic setting where these wetlands occur, how they function, where they get their salt from, and what kind of makes them unique. We'll cover a little bit about the early history of the wetlands, talk about how we've altered the wetlands considerably over the years, the benefits that these wetlands provide, and then we'll, I'll finish with talking about some of the conservation measures that we're taking overall for, for the conservation of these saline wetlands, um, including the Salt Creek Tiger Beetle, and then Sean will get into more details about the life history of the beetle and, and the conservation efforts going on for that, which is some really neat stuff. So, so uh, stay tuned for that. So, uh, so this is a map out of a wetland guide that's on uh, the website, nebraskawetlands.com. Uh, the saline wetlands are located right here in mostly in Lancaster and southern Saunders County. This uh, green polygon shows where the unique eastern saline wetlands are, are located. And uh, so we have a lot of amazing uh, wetland resources across the state, um, a, a wide diversity of wetlands, but the, the eastern saline wetlands are 
are, are very unique in how they get their groundwater and some of the plant and animal species that use them, and I'll mention. So zooming in a little bit to Lincoln, showing again Lancaster and Saunders County, the green um, polygon is, is outlined here in the green color, and then the biologically unique landscape from our uh, Nebraska Natural Legacy Plan is shown in kind of the purple color. It just kind of narrows it in, showing the uh, distribution of this biologically unique landscape along Salt Creek. So this is Salt Creek flowing through Lincoln, like through Wilderness Park, exiting uh, the northeast part of Lincoln, flowing to Waverly, Ashland, and then joining the Platte River. And the saline wetlands in white here, kind of shown where they, the saline wetlands occur. You can see how they fall along uh, Salt Creek, appropriately named Little Salt Creek, Rock Creek, and some of the other tributaries to Salt Creek. So that's where these saline wetlands can, can be found. So they occur in these stream or alluvial valleys, and I'll, I'll mention why that is in a moment. So you don't find a saline wetland up on a hillside. You tend to find it along these, these streams, somewhere in the, the floodplain of Salt Creek, and again, the, the tributaries to Salt Creek. And so the source of the salts is, is quite um, unique for the, the saline wetlands. We have some alkali wetlands out in the western part of Nebraska, and they get their salts from, from just kind of uh, regular groundwater that, that seeps into those and then evaporates away. But the saline wetlands get uh, their salinity, their salt, from groundwater that is already full of salts. So the groundwater comes up through some formations of bedrock under these stream valleys, rises to the surface. It's under pressure, so it, it hits a, a spot where groundwater flows like streams, although much slower, and it can get pressurized. And when it gets pressurized, and it will start to move upward. And that's what happens in the area around Lincoln. So the salt, the saline waters get under pressure and they move upward. And they move through these alluvial materials, through these sands and gravels and clays, work their way up again to the surface of the floodplain and create the unique saline wetlands. So this is an illustration, the cross section of what uh, kind of a, a, a hypothetical saline wetland would be like. And it's in a Nebraska land article called Success in the Salt Marsh. It, uh, Mike Forsberg wrote, it was in our magazine in 2018. So really neat resource to, to learn more about the saline wetlands and, and how they function. So. <clears throat> the source of the water, uh, this is not a saline wetland and this is not Lincoln. I think you can figure that out. Uh, this is the a stream coming out of the Rocky Mountains. And so you're kind of like, well, why does that relate to our saline wetlands here in, near Lincoln? And the reason is, is that the source of the groundwater comes from the Rocky Mountains. And so just like the surface flows, a tributary to the Platte flows in the surface across Nebraska and uh, and, and um that we're all very familiar with, groundwater also has regional movement patterns. So water that seeps into the ground out in the foothills of the Rockies gets down into the bedrock formations that ultimately pass under Lincoln. And that water then moves, uh, this is a cross section, it's a little blurry, sorry about that, but this is kind of a cross section of the geology. This is where Denver would be located. So this is west over on the left, east. And so the waters move through marine shales that are highly salty and they pick up the salt. Uh, so it's fresh water coming off the Rockies, picks up the salt, moves across Kansas, parts of Nebraska, and hits this, uh, area, this area that it gets under pressure and it moves upward and it comes out in these stream valleys near Lincoln. And that's why they're very unique. It doesn't occur in many places uh, because the geology and the groundwater chemistry has to be just right for this to happen. So what happens is you actually get a salt crust that forms. And so this is standard table salt, sodium chloride, uh, a crust that forms. So these salty groundwaters work up to the streams, uh, the surface of the land, evaporate, and you get these white, uh, after some dry periods, you'll get actually a white salt flat or crust appearing. Now, talk a little bit about the history of these wetlands. We know they were important to the, the native peoples that, that uh, occupied this land for thousands and thousands of years. There's some records of, of their use and in, in noting uh, the importance of these saline wetlands, both as a sort, salt source and also because they attracted a lot of game species that were important to the, the Native American tribes that, that uh, lived in this landscape. 
And so there's a long history of human interaction with these saline wetlands. And then when Lewis and Clark uh, in the early 1800s came up to the Missouri River, they sent an expedition up the Platte River as well. And it's interesting, they came to what I have underlined and in bold here. Uh, the party came to a small river, comes into the Platte called Salt River. So they called it Salt River. The water is so brackish or salty that it can't be drank at some season. So to me, that's really neat that the Lewis and Clark expedition in like uh, 1804 um, noted that Salt Creek down near Ashland was actually so salty uh, that it was no, uh, worth noting in their journals. And so um, a, again, a, a long history there. Uh, this is one of the earlier um, European um, ex, ex, um, settlers in the Lincoln area, W.W. Cox from uh, uh, describing the Lincoln landscape in 1861. Won't go into all the details here, it's a, but it's a neat quote in one of our magazine articles uh, describing uh, the scene that eventually became Lincoln. And it's interesting to me, he talked about the, the uh, Salt Creek, the tall sunflowers. He talked about a uh, a herd of antelope, which we don't think of in eastern Nebraska much, but antelope being present, and that the fresh breeze sweeping over the salt basins reminded us of the morning breezes at the ocean beach. So I thought that was a neat observation from 1861 of, uh, of the salts that, um, uh, the saline wetlands, where uh, eventually Lincoln became established as a community and, and eventually the, the state capital. And so again, this landscape was settled um, um, in the uh, 1860s, 70s, 80s, a rapid uh, settlement occurred, and this is a sod house uh, uh, in the area from the uh, mid 1800s uh, where Lincoln now stands. So, I have some neat uh, historical perspectives about, about this landscape. And one of the things really noteworthy, a lot of people think Lincoln was established, I always joke, people think it was established around Memorial Stadium at their football fans, and, and they may think that. but uh, Realistically, or, or, or uh, what really happened was Lincoln was established as a community because of the importance of the saline wetlands. The salt, salt we don't think of as a valuable commodity as much these days because it's cheap and abundant. But back in the 1800s, salt was rare and it was extremely important because they didn't have refrigeration. So if you were going to do food preservation, you needed a source of salt. And so Lincoln was established as a salt mining community, salt extraction community in the 1870s and 80s and 90s. And they were taking hundreds of thousands of barrels of salt a year out of Lincoln. So it's kind of interesting. Lincoln isn't on the Platte River, the Missouri River, like many of our communities in Nebraska, but sits, it sits uh, in a kind of an odd location along Salt Creek. The reason for that is because of the saline wetlands and the importance, the economic value those wetlands had in the 1800s. A lot of people think of Jay Sterling Morton and associate, associate him with Arbor Day, which is correct, but uh, the Morton is also uh, associated with Morton Salt. So um, interestingly, he, uh, he bought property in the Lincoln area and established a salt extraction company that became Morton Salt, so, um, which, uh, which is still a common brand name today. So a long history there associated with these saline wetlands and, and the, again, the unique, um, unique chemistry that happens when those salt, uh, salt waters come to the surface and evaporate and they can harvest that as a, as a commodity. Hey, Ted, this is Amber. Yes. Sorry, I just very, this is so cool, very interesting. And I, a lot yeah. of this I had no idea about. Um, was Morton Salt, did, did it start then in Lincoln because of the saline wetlands or was that just a separate thing here? As far as I know, I mean, the, the Morton family started Morton Salt and whether they had salt interests in other places prior to, I'm not sure, Amber. So. How cool. Um, I had no yeah. idea that, you know, the importance of, of yeah. establishing Yeah, you can think of Jay Sterling Morton and Arbor Day. Yeah. But the family also had an interest in the Lincoln area, so. Very yeah. cool. Okay, yeah. sorry, carry on. Very yeah, cool. Not a problem. So this is a neat photo from the Digital Commons at the university from 1902 showing Salt Creek and Lincoln in the background and um, see some of these smokestacks, which would be probably where downtown Lincoln is. So this would be out kind of towards Pioneers Park, uh, between Pioneers Park and Lincoln. Couldn't find the exact location, but it's just interesting. Uh, first off, no trees in the landscape. It's a prairie landscape. And Salt Creek, if you think of it today, is this kind of deep incised uh, ditch um, 
wasn't that, obviously, uh, historically. You can see how close to the surface of the, the landscape the, the creek was compared to what it is now. Uh, so this was just a neat photo I thought I'd share with you. So. And then interestingly, the salt industry collapsed uh, like many commodity uh, industry, uh, commodities can. Uh, cheap, abundant salt was found in underground sources. And so it was no longer economically viable to scrape the surface of the wetlands every day and try to barrel the salt up. And so the salt industry collapsed in the late 1800s, but Lincoln by that time was already established. And another thing people don't realize about um, the saline wetlands is they were kind of our modern uh, oceans of fun, worlds of fun, so to speak. Uh, this is Capitol Beach area in the, uh, again, 1890s to, to the 1930s. There was, it was a large amusement park uh, called Burlington Beach or Capitol Beach. Big roller coaster. They had these uh, saline mineral baths that people were attracted to. Uh, Burlington Northern Railroad actually ran a rail spur up to Capitol Beach so people could take advantage of the mineral uh, mineral waters and, and enjoy the, the uh, Burlington Beach uh, amenities. So kind of interesting. That's all changed obviously as well and become what is now called Capitol Beach, highly altered from its historic saline characteristics. So. And then what happened is Lincoln became established as a community. The salts lost their value. And like in many places, the wetlands were then viewed kind of as an impediment in the way of the development and growth of the city. And so a lot of alterations started happening to the saline wetlands. And this is a photo from 1941 of when they were channelizing Salt Creek. So taking that creek that uh, was meandering kind of near the surface and had salt uh, wetland, saline wetlands associated with it, they basically dug the creek out, straightened it, deepened it, and caused uh, and put levees along the side to keep the flooding in check. And that was for two purposes. It was to prevent flooding, which was a problem because we built right in the floodplains and right near and on the saline wetlands. It was also to get our, our human waste out. Uh, this was before we had good sewage treatment uh, uh, for, uh, uh, procedures. And so these were called sanitary improvement districts, which meant at that time, you get the water passing through faster downstream, so it leaves your town and goes to the next town downstream. So uh, unfortunately, that's how things happened back then. Uh, now, fortunately, we have good, better quality, water quality treatment that, that occurs and is required under, under federal law. But, but so they, they channelized, straightened uh, Salt Creek, which then uh, in the upper left here shows Salt Creek uh, the old meander scars, these old oxbows, this meandering stream that would have occurred. It's straightened, the water moves faster, and what happens is it starts to cut down. That energy gets dissipated, it cuts down and deeper into its, its, uh, into its stream bed. And this is a picture of Randy Studheit, our wetland biologist, standing in what's Little Salt Creek. I took this off the Arbor Lake uh, or Arbor Road uh, Bridge uh, on North 27th Street, uh, just north of Lincoln. Uh, we talked to farmers uh, from the like 1930s and 40s. They remember driving tractors with wagons across this creek. It was at the surface of the floodplain. Obviously, no farmer is going to be driving a tractor across this highly incised, uh, highly altered stream the way like Little Salt Creek and Salt Creek and the tributaries are today. And then what happens is, is that stream cuts down, water tries to equalize, tries to reach that level, and you get what we call these erosive head cuts. So these gullies that form going into the streams and those start to drain out the wetlands. And so the wetlands not only got uh, developed directly, but they also got secondarily impacted by the alterations that we made to Salt Creek and the associated tributaries. And then I mentioned the, the, uh, just the expansion of the city. So you had things like Hobson Rail Yard out in the western part of, this, of, of Lincoln. That was put right on top of some, a bunch of saline wetlands. And so those saline wetlands disappeared because they became this rail yard. Uh, many other parts of Lincoln, uh, this is in North Lincoln, this is a buffer to a saline wetland area, all developed with concrete and apartment buildings. Uh, not a lot of functioning uh, wetland left in many parts of the city because of the uh, development that occurred. This slide uh, shows that quite well, I think, 1955 on the left, aerial photo of the area. I'll start on the right here. This is 27th Street and Interstate 80, this interchange. If you're familiar with Lincoln at all, you're familiar with this interchange that's highly developed now where 27th Street and I-80 meet. 
This was what that area looked like in 1955. Interestingly, this is an NRCS photo. They had a line drawn out here showing the future path of Interstate 80. So this was, of course, before Interstate 80 got put in. There was no interchange. North 27th Street was a gravel road, and there was a little farmhouse here. I actually knew the woman who um, lived in this farmhouse when I came to Lincoln in the early 1990s. None of this development was here. Uh, that all happened when they opened this interchange with the interstate and all this development occurred in and around these areas that are saline wetland. Also interestingly, you can see all the salt flats and things that historically were present in 1955 showing up on this aerial and how many of those have kind of disappeared because of the alterations that have occurred. So it's important when we think about this to think about how this landscape's been altered, the hydrology, how, how we've changed the stream flow in the water, how we've developed and in, in, had some impacts. Not only do we have that to deal with, but we also have some invasive species to deal with, things like reed canary grass shown in the foreground and hybrid cattail in the back, both introduced species or species that have had their genetics altered, highly problematic in our wetlands, very aggressive spreaders, and they create a lot of uh, competition issues for our native saline plants and native wetland plants. That said, we have some really amazing, neat gems left, some saline wetland areas that are, are still highly functional and so uh, really, really neat to see. So uh, on the left, here's a salt flat with some salicornia or salt wort or pickleweed, it's called. It's a state endangered uh, species. On the left, a salt flat with some sea blight or sueda, it's called. It's kind of a blue-green color. So, so there are some uh, remnant saline wetlands still of, of, of good quality left. And I won't get into detail on this. Sean is going to talk about our uh, the Salt Creek tiger beetle, but we do have a number of our tier one and tier two uh, species considered at risk that use this biologically unique landscape uh, that we uh, call the Eastern Saline Wetlands and including the Salt Creek tiger beetle. But also we have the, the salt ward I mentioned is a state listed endangered plant and uh, is only found in Nebraska in these saline wetland areas. So, so something, uh, some, some really neat, unique uh, flora and fauna that, that occur in these areas. So just a picture of some of the other plants and plant communities that occur. We have flowering species like salt marsh aster up in the upper left. Uh, this is foxtail barley that's common in these uh, saline wetland areas growing in some of our meadowy areas. This is a Hay meadow area, um, hay meadow area uh, on a saline wetland. We have some uh, more traditional marshy areas that that uh, still occur that are are saline uh, marshes. And so, just an example of some of the diversity of of plant and and habitat types that occur. Then they attract a lot of unique wildlife and. Uh, uh, saline wetlands are probably most noted for their use by waterfowl and migrating shorebirds, but there's a whole host of fauna um, that use uh, uh, these areas. And these are all photos, by the way, by um, Mike Forsberg. Give Mike credit for, for these neat photos. He took these when he was doing the success in the salt marsh article for us. And so really uh, pleased to be able to use, uh, use these photos. And by the way, the photo credits, uh, <clears throat> or either the Mike Forsberg, some of the Platte Basin time lapse crew, or our Nebraska Land Magazine uh, staff. If the photos are kind of marginal, they're probably ones I took and put in the, the presentation. So, um, but yeah, really neat showing the diversity of, of wildlife uh, uh, species that occur in these saline wetlands right outside of town. It's really neat when you take someone out there. We can be in view of the capital, maybe a mile or two out, and you've got this abundance of wildlife, this diversity of, of plant and animal species. It, it's really unique and really a, a treasure that we need, to, uh, we need to embrace here in Lincoln. And that provides a lot of great amenities to the city, not only a place for outdoor recreation, but uh, you get further out, some of our areas are open to, to traditional uses, such as hunting uh, for pheasants or waterfowl. And then the, the one on the lower right is, uh, is a picture in 2015 of one of these wetlands after a major flood that happened. And all this water, a lot of acre feet of water being stored in the Whitehead wetland near Interstate 80 and 27th Street. If this had fully developed out, none of that water would have been stored there and it would have caused even worse flooding in, in Lincoln. So having these floodplain areas intact, these wetlands present is, is really important for, that, for flood control, water quality, as well as outdoor recreation. 
So shift now and close up kind of talking about wetland conservation initiatives in the earliest part uh, of it. Uh, people like Frank Shoemaker collecting and documenting salt creek or tiger beetles and and some of the, the plant species. This is a really neat photo from the early 1900s of, of him out there with a, a net on a, on a salt flat chasing tiger beetles. And then there was a big effort, a, a kind of in the regulatory arena and, and also in the outreach uh, arena. Uh, John Farrar put out the uh, Nebraska Salt Marshes Last of the Least in the early 1990s. A number of resource agencies worked on categorizing and trying to uh, uh, protect uh, some of the uh, re remaining wetlands, but it was clear it was going to be kind of a battle to the uh, a battle to the end, so to speak, if we just did that uh, through the regulatory process, because there was ongoing development of the city that uh, had to be addressed. and And um, I give the city huge credit, uh, City of Lincoln, in their comprehensive plan uh, back in the day. This was about 20 years ago. Put a green print challenge together, identifying saline wetlands as being important, along with prairies, streams, uh, endangered, threatened species habitat. And they steered the growth of the city away from some of these areas. And so all that growth that occurred up to Interstate 80 hasn't jumped the interstate and moved north of, of uh, Interstate 80 because the city basically took it out of their comprehensive plan for future growth. And so that was a, a big credit uh, to this uh, and a big help to the conservation of these wetlands. Then finally, the, uh, uh, the Saline Wetlands Conservation Partnership was established in the early 2000s. A uh, group of us uh, meeting in the uh, upper right here, and some of the original members. Uh, I was one of those uh, original members. We'd hired Tom Malmstrom, some of you may know, as a coordinator. This is us, uh, uh, a, a uh, improved version, a uh, later version of our group. Uh, Nicole Flectus with the city, myself, uh, Kelsey Werman with Pheasants Forever, Dan Schultz with the NRD, and Tom Malmstrom with the city of Lincoln. So. Uh, a great group of people working. We've got a, a current implementation plan that guides the activities that we're doing to, to protect and, and, um, and restore and bring back these saline wetlands. And this is out of the, uh, um, the uh, success in the salt marsh article showing some of the properties that have been protected, uh, lands protected in kind of this pink color were prior to the partnership and then in green are some of the actions that the partnership has taken to secure land from willing sellers to uh, help protect it, restore it, and, and provide all those services that those wetlands provide. And just a web link, you can find a lot more information about these, uh, about the Saline Partnership and about these properties and where they are and how to use them at, at that particular website. And just kind of wrap up with, uh, this is a Jackson Wildlife Management Area by Ceresco on Rock Creek. Uh, showing kind of the pre-restoration. A lot of the water went through drainage ditches and into these road ditches and, and off the area. And this is after some work we did through a variety of different partners uh, to put uh, water uh, saline wetlands back on that landscape. So you can see if you're, you're a, a, a wildlife species that likes wetlands, you're going to like the one on the right a lot better than the one on the left. You got a lot more habitat provided. We're still trying to figure out how to maximize the saline uh, potential of these sites. And that's an ongoing effort that's going to take ongoing science. And so we encourage, you know, the universities and there's a number of studies, some going on, some that have been done. There's a lot of room to continue to expand our knowledge and learn more about these unique saline wetlands. And with that, that kind of wraps up my portion of the presentation. I got a little tiger beetle that comes across here to hand it off to Sean. So, <laughs> so there he walked across there. And uh, so I'll stop my share and then Amber, we can. Yeah. Do we do have any questions from questions? anyone as we transition um, to Sean's PowerPoint? That was a really great presentation. Um, okay. Ted, I remember going out to some of these wetlands during some of my courses um, in my getting the, my fisheries and wildlife degree with Dave Wadeen going out there and, and even seeing that salt war and, and stuff. Yeah. So um, what a remarkable ecosystem that is. Can you remind yeah. me though, saline wetlands, I mean, they're such a unique ecosystem. Are they found anywhere else in the world? Are they very rare or is it just, it's so rare right here in Lincoln? What, what does that kind of look like on a big picture? I mean, they're rare. I mean, obviously saline wetlands on coastal marine systems are, are, are common, but 
interior saline wetlands are quite rare. They do occur in other places in the world and in other, uh, like Quivera National Wildlife Refuge in Kansas is an example. They, they have some saline, a similar system, probably some of the same groundwater actually that can come up there and and, oh, uh, is it created from that same um, process that you kind of mentioned? As far as we know, I've not been able to find out as much about that um, system, but the actual bringing in the salty groundwater is unusual. We have some alkali wetlands further west, uh, some up in the Dakotas that become, they get long-term groundwater discharge, groundwater moves into them, then they evaporate and they become highly alkali. A little different salt, a little different chemistry than what we have here. But there it's really more like fresh groundwater that just has minute amounts of salt that over time evaporates and concentrates. Mm -hmm. That's more common in semi-arid environments. But this the salty water coming in at kind of almost sea seawater level salinity is quite unusual. I think Amanda has a question. And Amanda, yeah. feel free to um, unmute in your video too if you'd like, but go ahead and ask your question for Ted. Um, Ted, I was wondering about the um, Pennsylvania limestone layer. I was thinking about what you're talking about, how fresh water from Colorado and the Rocky Mountains flows all the way across our state um, and basically it's like it accumulates that salinity. So my question is, I kind of have two questions really, is in addition to that limestone layer, are there any other geological layers that contribute to the highly saline salinity that we have in Lincoln? Or is it really that limestone layer? It's actually, uh, yeah, I probably glossed over that a little too quickly. The that diagram of the cross section showing kind of Colorado to Nebraska or a little broader than that in the geology. There were actually some things labeled on there, marine shales. And the source of those marine shales was when, when this was part of a, 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 a was covered by by sea, by ocean, basically. The interior part of the U.S., you know, the oceans uh, do continental changes and and uh, land level changes and things. You know, this was an interior sea at one point. Why we find marine uh, mammal or marine animal fossils, you know, in our bedrock and things. So, um, and so as we understand that the source of the salinity is, is trapped seawater, trapped concentrations of salt in these underground shales that then passes through the limestone, through the sandstone, through the alluvial materials and gets up into the saline wetlands. So, but we so don't have a super understanding okay. of that, that I know of. But. Okay, so it sounds like it's just a bunch of contributing factors. Cause that's kind of leading to my second question is I was gonna ask how big that layer is, but it, it's not, sounds like the salinity is not based on just that layer. So it's yeah, and mosaic it, underground. Yeah, that's complicated because you've got all these different aquifers and we think of an aquifer as one thing, but aquifers are quite complicated and different layers, different aquifers and different ages of water, different geologies. Um, and the other thing, you know, there's a lot of the underground, I talked about underground salt mining, you know, caused our salt my, uh, extraction off the wetlands to collapse. Well, some of those underground mines are in Kansas. I mean, in Oklahoma, they actually have mines where they go down underground and you know, mine this block salt. And so certainly some of that water could well come through those kinds of formations and salt dissolves and then gets in the water and you have this water get highly saline, so. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah. Amanda, thank you so much for that great question. Do you, do you have a background in, in uh, wetland science yourself? Uh, a, a little bit. Um, I'm a, I work, in fact, Ted, the, I went with, uh, site visit with Ted this morning. Um, I work for the Fish and Wildlife Service and um, cool. I'm participating to hear the information that Ted and Sean have to share, but um, I'm doing a little learning myself. So that awesome. was um, the underground geology play, my understanding plays a huge role. So that's Very something cool. I'm just yeah. trying to get on board with. Yeah. But my bi I'm a biologist as well. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much for that question. That was excellent. And I also agree. That was a really neat graphic. Um, I've never seen that graphic before, Ted. I actually took a picture with my phone of it because I've oh. never seen that. <laughs> That's kind of cool. So, um, okay. Any other questions before we get to Sean's presentation? I know that we're really excited about Salt Creek tiger beetles. Are you excited about tiger beetles? We are really <laughs> excited over here. Yes, it's about tiger beetles. Any other questions? <laughs> All right, Sean, would you like to get going and talk about these cool little critters? 
Yeah, absolutely. Can you see my cursor moving around the beetle? Yes, I can. Yep. Okay. Just making so sure is probably great. point some things out as we as we go forward here. So uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Sean Dunn. I'm the natural heritage zoologist for Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. So um, I'm a little bit of a, a generalist. I take care of our um, insects, our non-game mammals, small mammals. Uh, and herps, so reptiles and amphibians. And uh, so if we are concerned about those populations, I try to go out and see where they are or work with folks that are already working with those species. So, um, so I, I get to cover a lot of species, which is, is really fun. Um, I enjoy that uh, a lot. And so one of those species that I work with is the Salt Creek tiger beetle. And, you know, as Ted, talked about, you know, the, the saline wetlands are just this uh, really wonderful area that, um, you know, play host to so many species. Um, you know, a lot of people are out there looking at birds. We see mammals. We uh, can do some good hunting on the saline wetlands. Um, we know of it of at least 700 plus uh, species of insects that uh, use the saline wetlands. Um, Steve Spomer, who's uh, one of the main biologists that uh, started studying the Salt Creek tiger beetle, uh, has been keeping an inventory of what species are out there. And I mean, it's just this incredible area. Um, and so this beetle is just one small piece of all of this, but it's a really neat piece. Um, I'm super excited that I get to uh, work on this program and, and be a part of it. And so what I'll do tonight is just kind of um, take you through uh, a little bit of natural history of the tiger beetles, the propagation that we're currently doing. So when we're raising them in labs um, and kind of show you uh, what our hopes are for bringing the species, at least uh, get it off the endangered list. So. For those of you that don't know tiger beetles, um, they are beetles. So they're in a family of ground beetles. So that's Carabidae. It used to be its own separate family, the tiger beetles, but now it's generally accepted that they're in the ground beetle family. Um, there's over 2,500 species worldwide and, and that number changes, you know, depending on who you're talking to, whether they're lumpers or splitters and all of this and taxonomy. Um, but a lot, so a lot of species. Um, they're medium-sized beetles, you know, there are some really large beetles and then there are some, you know, real tiny ones. These guys are kind of in the middle um, and they're extremely fast. It's one of those things that um, when you start reading about tiger beetles and talking to people that study them, it's the one thing they'll talk about. Um, is that they can move very, very quickly. There's some things on the internet, I don't know if it's true, but um, that sometimes they move so fast that their vision can't keep up with it. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but it gives you an idea of how quickly uh, we think they may be moving. Um, they have very powerful, sharp and serrated mandibles. So you can see in this picture where this little guy is biting me here or trying to, He's got these mandibles all spread out, trying to get a chunk of me so that I'll let him go. And you can see that these are serrated and really sharp, really good for grabbing prey items and, and pulling them into their, uh, their mouth and being able to chew them, uh, bits of them off and, and being able to eat them. Have you ever had one predator. break through the skin? What's that? Have you ever had one break through the skin? I, I have not. I've had a couple of good pinches, but not through the skin. So, um, but they are a very good, highly effective predator. So again, those two items above very fast and those very sharp mandibles um, make them excellent predators. And many of them are really colorful. You know, we've got just a couple of examples here. These are ones that you can find in our saline wetlands uh, right here around Lincoln. And um, these are just a couple of them. But if you look worldwide, I mean, there are every color imaginable practically for um, our tiger beetles. And they live in a wide variety of environments. When you get 
this many species of anything, um, you know, birds, beetles, uh, mammals, you know, they tend to be able to adapt to all sorts of environments. So almost anywhere you go in the world, there's probably going to be uh, tiger beetles there. So these are some of the tiger beetles of the saline wetlands. Um, this first one, Cicindella fulgida. So this one actually comes in two colors that we commonly see around here. Um, this kind of uh, purple color and then this real dark blue. It almost looks like a black. Um, but this is one that you'll commonly see. They come out pretty early. So um, here I was out looking at the saline wetlands uh, a week ago and I saw one individual of this species out. Uh, two that are kind of difficult to tell apart um, until you really get used to seeing them. This top one is Circumpicta. So uh, it's got this nice ring of kind of cream color all the way around it. Um, and it's not real thick cream color, but it's still, it's still there. It's strong. It's easy to see. This one below it is Togata. Now this one is, has the cream color, but it goes mu it's much thicker. Also, this species is a couple of millimeters smaller. And I know that doesn't sound like a whole lot, but when you've been out there for a couple hours looking at all the different beetles go back and forth, um, and you, a couple millimeters makes a big difference. So you can see pretty quickly like, oh, that one's smaller than, than that one over there. Um, that one's likely Togata um, because again, they're really fast. So being able to get up close enough to them sometimes is kind of difficult uh, to see what species it is. So when we go out there to do the annual surveys for the Salt Creek tiger beetles, um, you kind of have to watch their behavior and you kind of have to you know, move really carefully to see which species it is. Uh, this guy right here is one of the ones that looks a lot like uh, our Salt Creek tiger beetle. This is uh, Rapanda. So this one has markings on its elytra here. So elytra are the kind of the wing coverings and beetles um, that are very similar to uh, the Salt Creek tiger beetle, which is down here in the bottom right hand corner. But the difference is uh, Rapanda is usually very well heavily marked round edges on uh, kind of the tips of the coloration. Whereas the Salt Creek tiger beetle, those edges tend to be what we call reduced. Um, they're not as thick towards the end uh, and they kind of taper off. But the problem is that you'll sometimes get a Salt Creek tiger beetle that has almost no markings on it, just very thin lines. And sometimes you'll get ones that are marked almost exactly like a rapanda. And so again, when we're out there looking at these things in the field, we're looking at not only their markings, but their behavior as well. Um, and after you're out there time and time again, you kind of get used to picking them out pretty quickly. Um, but it does take a little bit of time. So again, when you go out to the saline wetlands, which I hope you do, um, you know, these are the other species you're likely to see. So make sure you take some time and try to get a good look at them. Um, and see if you can tell uh, what species uh, you've got there. So moving on to the actual Salt Creek tiger beetle. Um, so the scientific name is, um, it used to be in Cicindella, but they've been kind of breaking apart that genus. Um, uh, so now it's generally accepted that it's uh, Elisoptera nevatica lincolnana. And um, this is a nice individual here. They're about a half an inch long, so when you're out in the field, pretty small. They have a greenish to brown coloration. That varies. Sometimes it can be like a, a pretty bright green, uh, sometimes with like gold accents. Um, and then other times they're kind of dull brown. So um, it, it really varies quite a bit. Um, the adults use these bare salt flats for foraging. So, if you remember that picture that Ted showed of Shoemaker where he was out catching tiger beetles, that's perfect Salt Creek uh, tiger beetle habitat. Uh, not a whole lot of vegetation, very bare, lots of salt out there. And if you remember Salt Creek, which I assume that was Salt Creek or one of the other um, smaller tributaries, was very small, rather shallow. 
Um, and that's perfect habitat because they like to have some water nearby. Um, the adults are typically active from June through early August. Uh, the adults are only around for about uh, six weeks. And then as I mentioned a minute ago, the, uh, they really like to have water around. So some of those other species I, I showed you in the previous slide, um, they'll hide during the heat of the day under vegetation. Um, they'll be down by water sometimes, uh, but they tend to stick to vegetation to, in the shade to stay cool. Uh, the Salt Creek tiger beetle really likes to have water nearby. And we think that's because they're using that to cool off during the heat of the day, because they'll be out moving when it's really hot. They also use the shade, but that water uh, component is, seems to be really important to them. Now their habitat, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is very similar to what Ted showed. Um, they like to have those um, salt flats without a lot of vegetation. You know, we're talking about Little Salt Creek, uh, Rock Creek, uh, that's at the northern part of Lancaster County. Um, and they don't really need a whole lot of vegetation. They're okay with that. It helps them hide from predators. Um, but they sure do like just kind of open areas, not a lot of vegetation, a lot of salt. That's, that seems to be their, their biggest need. And the females use that salty area to lay their eggs. So from our breeding in the lab, um, we found that once the females lay their eggs in the salty soil, they really don't require um, the high salinity soil for any other part of their uh, life cycle. Um, the adults are the only ones that really disperse, so they can fly, uh, not too far, we think. And then um, they're really only able to fly during that uh, active part when the adults are out, so from uh, June through maybe early August. And again, when we go out, we're looking for areas where we can see that salt seeping out of the soil. Um, if, we, if you can't literally see, you know, kind of whitish gray areas, they're probably not going to be uh, Salt Creek tiger beetles there. They're likely the other species, but um, one thing that, you know, we're really able to pick out pretty quickly is, okay, if there's salt here, we're likely to see the beetles, but that water is the other really important component. Hey, Sean, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, that, that high salinity content requirement for the females to lay the eggs, mm -hmm. does anyone know um, what the, the factor, what the variable is? Is it, is it she just will not lay unless the, she has a high salinity or will the eggs not hatch unless there's a high salinity environment? Does anyone know like what that variable is? That's kind of, I'm curious about that. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if we've ever removed eggs from the high salinity soil and, and moved them to non-salinity soil to see what would happen. I would assume they'd be just fine. Um, my thought is that they do this for resource partitioning. So when you go out here to these habitats, there are areas where um, it is very salty and then you can step a few meters away and it is um, almost no salt at all. And there's a gradient. And so you'll see uh, three different species laying eggs very close to each other. And so I think it's one of those things that they're just kind of resource, um, they're partitioning out the, the resource based on uh, the amount of salinity. Oh, that's okay. my guess, but that's about the only thing I can think of that would make sense of why they would require that. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. So are those, so your, you can see the, are those your technicians? Are those your technicians helping you there on the on the right? Yeah. So you can yeah. see I, I had some help here, and um, just to give you an idea of um, what that salt looks like out there, you know, some of these hillsides have been incised uh, quite a bit from from the flooding, and uh, like looking at this next slide, you know, this is a much a uh, more steep area with a lot of cutting. And this has happened um, just from the amount of water that's flowing through Little Salt Creek. 
But even then, you still get these areas where we're finding salt seeping in. And those are the, the really important areas uh, for the, this beetle. And so these are largely the properties that we're focused on um, for getting, uh, not only monitoring, um, but augmenting current populations of Salt Creek tiger beetle. Um, you know, Lincoln is just south of uh, some of these properties. The green properties are owned uh, by Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. The blue properties are owned by the NRD, the Little Platt South NRD. Uh, the yellow one here, the Helmuth, is owned by Pheasants Forever. And then these purple properties are owned by uh, City of Lincoln. So Ted mentioned earlier, one of the groups working together uh, on this project is the Saline, uh, um, Saline Wetland Conservation Partnership. It's, it's a wonderful uh, kind of grouping of organizations that came together to really help, um, you know, conserve these areas. But not only that, but everyone that works on um, the Saline Wetlands and the Salt Creek Tiger Beetle are just wonderful, wonderful partners. And I think this graphic shows that, um, at, you know, one representation of the way everyone is working together um, to really um, help restore some of these areas and conserve these areas, not only for the beetle, but as Ted mentioned, for hunting, for recreation, for lots of different things. So um, I just, I love this graphic because it really shows that really well. So life cycle of the Salt Creek tiger beetle. So as I mentioned, the adults emerge in early June. And then after mating, the females lay their eggs in that salty soil. Um, and then once the eggs hatch, there are these itty little bitty larvae and they will dig a hole into the soil. And um, once they do that, they will stay there for up to two years. Uh, and then they will pupate, which means they'll basically uh, kind of close up and then change into adult. And then they'll crawl out and be an adult. And the first thing they got to do is find something to eat, mate, and lay their eggs. And so that's the whole life cycle. It takes about two years being underground. And then they have six weeks above ground to mate and lay eggs as many times as they can. Um, both the adults and the larvae, again, are, are predators. Uh, they will eat anything that moves that um, is smaller than them. So, uh, and there's lots of things out there in these wetlands. Um, you get columbula, which are like these little tiny uh, springtails, I think are the common name. Um, there's all sorts of uh, little insects, fly larvae. There's all sorts of spiders out there. I mean, when you're out there, you know, if you just stop moving at the edge of some water and just watch, it, 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 the ground practically comes alive with all sorts of little stuff moving around. And those are perfect prey items uh, for all the tiger beetles, but especially Salt Creek tiger beetle that um, we're talking about. So as learning part of their life cycle, uh, we found out quite a bit when we started uh, rearing these guys in the lab to help restore the populations. So since 2011, we've been working with various partners, um, the Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo, University of Nebraska Lincoln, and then Lincoln Children's Zoo. Um, those three were some of the original uh, partners and then a couple of years ago, Topeka Zoo um, and Conservation Center in Kansas started helping us as well. And so we've got four facility uh, raising tiger beetles for us. And it takes a lot of time and personnel uh, to do this. And I'll, I'll talk about why that is. But um, every year we learn a little bit more. You know, again, we've been doing this for 10 years now and we are still learning things uh, each and every year. We meet multiple times a year, the, uh, the whole team, and we talk about, well, what's working well for you, what's not, um, and everyone's improving as, as we go on. And so these are kind of the mating chambers. So we have, we uh, will keep some beetles um, back that we'll use for mating. 
And then if our you know, stock is getting low, sometimes we'll bring in wild tiger beetles as well to mate. And then this is the um, place where we leave them for a couple of days. They will mate and then the females will lay their uh, eggs in one of these uh, little square petri dishes. And these have uh, two different concentrations of saline water in them. So it's a specific kind of sandy mix that um, the Henry Dorley Zoo uh, mixes up specifically for this project. And then on top of that, um, they wet them down with uh, two different concentrations of uh, salty water. That allows the female tiger beetle to choose whichever salinity she wants to lay her eggs in. And they typically do lay their eggs in the slightly higher salinity one, but a lot of times they lay it in, in both concentrations of salt. So it's good that we kind of give them a choice um, where they want to lay their eggs. And then once the eggs hatch, uh, the larvae will uh, start, let me point out these little holes here, they'll start digging little holes and then that's where they will hide out to steer clear of predators. And that's where they will um, wait for things to go by for them to eat. And so if you look here, this is a zoomed in shot. Um, I'll circle the little larvae here. This is how big they are. So they go through three larval instars. So they've got uh, what we call L1, 2, and L3. So really creative with our names. But so larvae one, after they hatch, is just this itty bitty little thing about the size of a grain of rice. Uh, the eggs, you can imagine, are very small. So this is one that uh, Steve Spomer, who I mentioned earlier, was in one of his publications. These are, um, you know, grains of sand here. And so you can see the eggs are not that much bigger than uh, these grains of sand. And so I don't know how they found these. I'm sure it took quite some time, but those are what will hatch and then the little larvae will come out of. So we have a problem. This is where I was talking about it gets really um, time dependent for a lot of our personnel. So tiger beetles are ambush predators. So the larvae will sit in their hole and they'll wait for something to come by and they'll grab it, bring it down, and they'll eat it. The problem is if you've got a bunch of tiger beetles from all those eggs hatching this one petri dish, when one starts moving around, if he goes to someplace else and decides to dig a new hole, if he goes past another tiger beetle, that tiger beetle will reach up, grab him, and eat him. And so unfortunately, we have to separate them. Um, now there's a couple ways you can do this. You can take this big block of soil here and you can break it apart and dig through it and look for all the larvae. Or we found you can stick a string down in the hole and the larvae will think it's some kind of bug or little yummy thing for them to eat and they'll grab onto it with their jaws and you can pull them out of the hole. So we call that our tiger beetle fishing. And um, the Henry Dorley Zoo figured this out by watching someone do it on YouTube. And they thought, well, you know, heck, maybe we could try that for this project. Lo and behold, it works. And that's how we're able to separate out um, each individual larvae. It takes some time to do. Now, in the beginning, we knew that the larvae um, were going up and down in the soil profile. So um, because they're there for two years, we knew they can't freeze. So as it gets colder, they go deeper. So in the beginning, we used to put them in these long tubes so that they could go up and down. And that way they could approximate what they would do in the wild as much as possible. Well, getting a larvae out of this really long tube is really difficult um, because again, they're fairly small. We have to check on them, make sure they're alive. Um, and so it, it was really problematic. One of those things that we found out about when they do and don't need salty soil. Well, we also found out once they become larvae, they really don't need all that depth. So now we actually put them into little individual condiment cups. So those little cups you get from restaurants with a lid on top, that's all they really need. Um, and we have pretty good success rates uh, raising them in those cups and it saves us a lot of time, a lot of soil, and um, a lot of frustration. So 
Um, I actually wasn't working on the project when they had those tubes, um, those big long tubes, but I've heard the nightmares that it was for the staff. So, um, so here's uh, one of the tiger beetles right here, um, just kind of waiting near the, the top probably for um, its food to be let in there. And then once they're in their individual cups, um, they get a code on there and then we put them into an incubator that um, simulates the sunlight for uh, what it's like in Lincoln, Nebraska, and then also temperatures as well. And those run 24 hours a day, um, uh, day in and day out. And so this is an L3. So if you remember the L1, the really tiny larvae, this one is an L3. So you can see here, even as the larvae, they have those big jaws on them. And uh, this is their head. So that's what they use to help pull down those prey uh, into their hole. I think I have a, an illustration of that here in a little bit. Um, but once we've raised these, then we've got to get them out, right? So we've got to um, put them out into the wild. So we go out and uh, we make holes in the ground. The easiest thing we found to do is take a little paintbrush. The back end of the paintbrush goes into the ground to make a hole for them. And then uh, we put them out on the ground and kind of encourage them gently with the bristles of the paintbrush to go into their hole. Um, I will say I've, I've done a lot of these now and they don't always like their hole. Um, sometimes they go in, fantastic, they love it. I've had several where I've put them in and then they just came crawling right back out. They went over a few inches and started digging their own hole. Mine with me, that's fine. But, um, but that's how we, we release these once we've raised them. This is the illustration I was just mentioning. So they have this kind of bump on one part of their body and that allows them to kind of anchor themselves into that hole. And then they basically wait with their head right at the top of the hole for anything to walk by. And then when it does, they're able to grab it with their, those powerful jaws and pull it into the hole and eat it. And in fact, let me, let me go back, I think on that one picture. So you remember that part where I said they kind of anchor themselves in a hole. This is that part of the larvae right here. And so if I had a better picture, you can actually see it's, it's a little raised bump. And I've seen them use it. They brace themselves pretty well um, in the hole when they do that. So here are some tiger beetles uh, in the hole, one right here. You can see that different colored soil on top. That's the soil from their, his little condiment cup, cup that he was in. And then here's one making a fast break for it after I put him out. Um, he decided he was going to go make his own hole. So totally fine. And then this is what we look for when we're out looking for wild ones or after we've released them um, and we go to follow up to see how they're doing. Um, this kind of marking around the hole lets us know that those, there's a larval tiger beetle in that hole. We don't always know if it's a Salt Creek tiger beetle or if it's Circumpicta or Togata or one of the other species, um, but we do know there's a tiger beetle there by looking at this kind of, um, you know, what we call like signature of that, um, that beetle. So how do we actually track what's going on? This is another area where we've done a lot of work um, trying to figure this out. Um, we used to use fiberglass poles and we'd put out ropes and every foot or so we would put um, a tiger beetle in there. And then we also um, started marking individual holes to say, okay, there's a tiger beetle here, there's one here, and then we could put tags on those poles to let us know which individual it was so we could actually track how well they were doing. But unfortunately, as Ted noted, these things hold a lot of water. Um, you know, these are wetlands, they get a lot of moisture through there, you get rain events, you get flood events, and then those poles basically get a lot of grass and vegetation stuck on them. Uh, and that's really difficult to help track what's going on. Also, as I mentioned earlier, we put tiger beetles in these holes, and then they get up and they move. And so um, we have a lot of data uh, from the first several years of when we would put out tiger beetles. And unfortunately, 
looking at it, it's really hard to draw any good conclusions from it um, because there are so many things that happen after you put the tiger beetles out. If they're missing from their hole, we don't know if they just left. We don't know if they're pupating. We don't know if they got picked out by a predator. Uh, we don't know if something came and scrubbed out a lot of that soil and they got moved or washed away. So it's really hard to tell uh, what happens and to be able to follow their progress. But once the larvae are in the ground, our hope is that they pupate. And this is um, what a, a, an adult looks like before it is fully hardened. So they go from that little larvae worm looking thing into the adult, the pictures that you saw earlier. And that's what we hope for. And then sometimes we even do adult re releases. So this is Mike Fritz, my predecessor, um, who started a lot of this and, and really was instrumental in, in helping out. Um, and this is a lot easier than releasing the larvae. We just kind of open the container and say, here you guys go. Um, and so that can be easier sometimes, but it's also really hard to raise the adults in the lab. So um, raising larvae tends to be a little more time consuming, but we have a better idea of how they're doing. And then finally, um, you know, I like this picture because, you know, Ted was talking about some of these uh, remnant areas um, in Lincoln. And this is I-80 right here. Oak Creek, this is Capitol Beach, which we know has gone through significant changes. But, you know, when you drive past the airport, which is right over here, always look to the side here because there's this beautiful example of um, what I like to think of as almost the last remnant of Capitol Beach that almost hasn't changed. There's always this, this really high salinity area out here that doesn't have a whole lot of vegetation. It's kind of that site where um, Ted showed that picture of, of Shoemaker when he was out there catching tiger beetles. I, I like to think this is that last kind of area um, that uh, of Capitol Beach that is still around. And you can drive by, right by it on I-80 and see it. So, and of course, you know, um, science and all of this doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, you know, I'm lucky enough to get to present this to you today, but there's a lot of people and a lot of organizations that make this stuff happen. So I'll just leave this list of people up here um, that help us and, and help with this organization and, and conserving the saline wetlands and the Salt Creek Tiger Beetle. Um, and I think that's all I've got. So I know we went past time there, sorry. But um, well, that's okay. Really good stuff. I didn't want to stop yeah. you. That was really, really cool. Thank you so much for that, Sean. How long have you been working with Salt Creek Tiger Beetles then on that project? So I've been in the zoologist position for um, about three years now. And, um, and before that, I had a little bit of experience with it. But um, really, in the last three years, it's been um, getting into it pretty, pretty heavy. That's really very cool. Um, I just want to make sure I'm looking at some of our comments that we had. Um, more comments and questions, but Amanda had said, I'll never forget C. Rapanda, one of those tiger beetles that you had mentioned, because it sounds like tiger beetle red panda. I thought that was pretty clever. No. <laughs> and um, Darlene said, you can also see the solar panels in the area you're talking about um, mm -hmm. by, the, by uh, Capitol Beach. So very cool. Um, is there any other questions from our participants tonight from our two fantastic biologists, zoologists, scientists here tonight? A lot of great content shared. Hey, Sean, I was wondering in the lab where Henry Dorley, where all the zoos really, um, do you guys know what the <laughs> concentration range is that the females prefer? Like what the salinity concentration is they prefer to lay their eggs in? I knew somebody was going to ask me that. Um, I don't. I don't remember exactly what they are, but um, I, I do have them written down somewhere. And and of course, Henry Dorley has it all in a book um, that they use, and they make up the the two molarities that they use. They uh, make them up every year, and they've kept them the same. So, um, but yeah, I can get that to you. Thank you. Uh, and Sean, uh, we have another question from Darlene. How do the solar panels affect the wetlands? Are they in those wetlands that 
that you mentioned? Yeah, let me let me go back here. So the the solar panels, um, I think she's talking about are over here. Um, isn't that right, Ted? Do you know? It yeah, they right they originally had we were going to put them right in some of the highest quality wetland. You know, they mm -hmm. didn't realize probably where that was. And so to their credit, they contacted us or we got in touch with them in the Fish and Wildlife Service. And we talked to them about placing them in a place that would be less harmful to the saline wetlands and not impact any this Salt Creek tiger beetle, which I don't think there were any there. But we did have the state listed plant saltwort present and wanted to make sure we avoided impacts to that. Yeah, and this, um, yeah, the solar panels are somewhere around in here, I believe, but they're they're up on the higher uh, part of the um, of the the habitat there, and it's really the more uh, wet areas that we would expect to find more of the um, the saltwort and the salt creek tiger beetle out there. But we actually haven't seen salt creek tiger beetles in this stretch for I think close to almost twenty years now. Um, but I still go out and look. Um, just in case uh, uh, um, a wily one gets out there and or, or wily two um, or a gravid female and starts laying eggs. So hopefully one day. Sean, do you have an estimate on how many, um, what's the current estimated population for Salt Creek tiger beetles? So last year we were at, I think, uh, around 350. Wow. And I mean, and it fluctuates a lot. I mean, this is what happens with, with insects sometimes is, um, you know, you get these really good years, conditions are great. Uh, and then you get other years when, you know, for Salt Creek tiger beetle, you've got massive flooding or uh, you've got a small flood, but it carries a lot of sediment in and covers up potentially mm. where the beetles are, or any number of other things. And so, um, you know, we consider our counts very conservative because mm -hmm. we don't want to draw them in using a nightlight. That would be a really good way to count them, but then they're expending that energy right. to come in. Yeah. It makes them more visible to predators, all sorts of stuff. Um, and so we basically walk through the areas where we know they are and count them. Um, we know we're probably missing some. So we consider our counts pretty conservative on that okay. end. But it really ranges anywhere from, I think our lowest one was um, about 150 individuals up to we've had somewhere just over a thousand, I think, or 1200. If you, I was gonna ask Sean, if, if you've ever considered using camera traps or some of the technology, you know, it's getting so much better to, mm -hmm. um, it's amazing what they're doing with some of that to track species, you know, could you at least do an index by, cameras in certain places. Obviously then you have the flooding issue and things to deal with. Yeah. And camera yeah, traps I, for I, insects. That would be is that being done? That would be really cool. If 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 you have a camera sensitive enough, you can. Right. The problem is then that camera is really sensitive and anything mm. sets them off. Um, and then you've got someone to go through and actually look at those as well. So, I mean, it's certainly possible, and I think you could take a, a sample of certain areas and do it. Um, it. I think it would be akin to like acoustic detectors for bats, though. It'd be really hard to know whether that's one beetle going back and forth or whether you've got multiple beetles going through an area. Um, you know, we've marked some in the past to try to do um, trap and, and or capture and, and recapture. And... Um, and the marks just don't seem to stick on them very well. Um, and so it's really difficult to do, but it's certainly possible. Um, another thing that we're looking into now is the potential of using eDNA to swab um, holes. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, when we come across an area, you know, a hole in the ground that's got kind of a little bit of dirt around it, we assume, okay, there's some kind of tiger beetle there, but we don't know what species it is. So if we could use eDNA and swab that and then test it and see what kind of um, tiger beetle is actually there, that could also be used as a measure of um, population status. Um, Sean, I was curious, sorry, I'm the one with all the questions, I apologize, but um, no, that's fine. really cool. One more, maybe, maybe. Um, 
Mm -hmm. So you said they're in the they're in the ground as the larva for two years, and then they're only adults for six weeks. Is that common among other tiger beetles, or is that uh, just the salt creek tiger beetle? No, that's fairly common across beetles. So when you have you know a um, again a, a group as as successful as tiger beetles, you know there's a, a wide variety of of um, life history strategies that um, are very successful. And so one thing that's really interesting though with Salt Creek tiger beetle, we found that um, in the lab, they tend to only take about a year to uh, pupate into adults. So that kind of tells me that it's resource dependent. So basically if you feed them a whole lot, they can get big enough to become adults. So it's probably resource dependent if you know, we could somehow feed them out in the wild more. Maybe we could get them to change over to adults faster and we could move along their uh, recovery faster. But I don't really know how to feed them in the wild very well. Yeah, oh, that's really interesting. Very cool. Well, thank you both so much. Um, a lot of really great information tonight and a lot of really cool things to um, just remember how grateful we are to live in Nebraska and, and for those of us who are joining um, us right here in Lincoln to have this amazing resource and these amazing insects right here um, outside of, you know, inside of the city. So very cool. Oh, one more question. Are there any be uh, beetles in the Lincoln Saline Wetlands uh, Nature Center? Do we have a nature center there? I think she's talking Pioneers Park. Wait, well, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, let's see. Or do you want to? Well, the the NRD calls that property by Capitol Beach the Saline Wetland Nature Center. There's not a so, building there. Oh, is that what you mean? Yeah, no, there's there's no yeah. Salt Creek tiger beetles there, but there are certainly tiger beetles there. Oh, cool. So you'll find some of the other species, uh, Circumpicta and Fulgita, will definitely be there. So very cool. Anyways, um, thanks for that question, Darlene. The sign says what I wrote. Okay. The sign, oh, she said the sign mentions maybe that they are there or maybe they were there or something. Yeah, probably yeah. that they were. I mean, we, you know, anywhere the saline wetlands were, um, you know, we can infer that they were likely there, so. Gotcha, okay. Well, thank you both so much and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, again, uh, we'll, prob we'll be sending you an evaluation and also we'll be sending you links in an email um, to any of the resources we mentioned tonight, including registration for our last um, wetland webinar talk, which is next Tuesday. So um, thank you all. And thank you, Sean and Ted. That was really excellent. I know I learned a lot and that's really exciting. So have a fantastic yeah. rest of your evening and enjoy the rest of um, America, America's uh, Wetland Month. Yeah. yeah. Thanks everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.